Ports of Call. Beyond blue horizons, far at the world then, strange, fascinating lands beckon us, bid us revel in their exotic splendors. Come with us as we head for Ports of Call. Lashed by the pounding Pacific, baked hot by dry tropic winds from the north, the Republic of Chile extends along the west coast of South America like a narrow sword with a curved point. Following the long, ragged coastline, our ship arrives at Valparaiso, a gay, busy metropolis built on varying levels, which are connected by corkscrew roads and electric elevators. Here we leave the ship to journey to Santiago, the capital of Chile. We speed to Santiago in clean electric cars. And gazing from the window, we see vast vineyards, cactus prodding its spines into walls of tiled adobe, round mud ovens, men in bright-colored ponchos toiling by the roadside. Year 1543. The little village of Santiago nestles in the hot, fertile valley of Quillota. Before the Comandante's hut stands Don Pedro de Valdivia, clad in bright armor. By his side, her chestnut hair shimmering in the morning sun, is a woman. A beautiful woman with eyes green as polished emerald. She is Doña Inez Sores, who, with Don Pedro, two years before, had founded Santiago. The day has come, Inez. I must depart for the seacoast. Will you be gone long? Perhaps several months. But you will return. Oh, I cannot forget that you have a wife in Spain. Oh, my darling. How can you doubt me? But I must build a ship so that we may transport gold to Peru. That is the king's command. What if there should be trouble while you are gone? The Indians may try to take advantage of your absence. The Indians will cause no trouble. I have thrown seven of their chiefs in prison. They will be kept in prison until I return. And my friend Felipe will watch over the village while I am gone. I understand. If the Indians attack, their chiefs must die. Just so. And on no condition shall those seven chiefs be released. As long as they are in prison, Santiago is safe. But Felipe will attend to all that. Ah, there's Lotaro. I told him to come. You have packed all the supplies, Lotaro? Everything is ready, Don Pedro. Then wait with the horses. I will join you there. We start at once. Yes, Don Pedro. I will be ready. Yeah, that Lotaro is a good servant. But he is an Indian. Oh, what of it? I must have someone to take care of I my... don't trust him, Pedro. You don't trust him? Inez, what possible reason could you have for not trusting Lotaro? He's been with me ever if since... If you are wise, you will get rid of him. Kill him. You send him back to his tribe. Do anything but get rid of him. Why? 
He has always been a faithful... I've been watching the Toro for many months. He's clever. And he has clear black eyes that might belong to the devil. I've been meaning to speak to you about it. You will send the Indian away? No, I will take him with me to the seacoast. Then keep him. But someday you will find out that I spoke the truth. And then it may be too late. Come in. Tony Ines. Oh, Felipe, what do you want? The Indian Lotaro is here. He wants to speak with you. A Taro? But he left for the coast of Don Pedro a week ago. He returned tonight. Hmm, that's queer. Yeah, have him come in. Come in, Lotaro. Why are you here, Lotaro? Don Pedro. He sent me. Why does he send you? Because Don Pedro was afraid my people might try to attack Santiago. That they might try to rescue the seven caciques. The seven caciques? Yes. The seven Indian chiefs who have been put in prison. The Indians will not dare an attack as long as we have their chiefs locked in prison. You know that. I know only my order. Don Pedro set me here with orders that the seven chiefs be released. He came to me first, Doña Ines, but I did not want to release the prisoners without consulting you. You are right in doing so, Felipe. The man is lying. No, no. Get out of here, Latoro. Go back to your people. Tell them that the seven chiefs will be held as hostages until Don Pedro returns. And if any attack is made on the town of Santiago, the seven chiefs shall die. But Dona Ines, I am Get out of this you. house. It's time for that I spare you your life. If Don Pedro were here, you would hang to the highest tree. Don't stand there staring. Get out. I go, Don Ines. I go. Uh, there will be trouble, Don Ines. Perhaps we should have had him thrown in prison until... That would have done no good. Toro is only one of many. Ah, but I'm afraid you're right, Felipe. There will be trouble. <laughs> I tell you, my comrades, it was that demon of a woman who ruined my plan. She knew that I was lying, that I had deserted Don Pedro. I think she even knew that we intend to destroy that accursed town. We cannot destroy the town, Lotaro. What will happen to the seven chiefs? The Spaniards would not dare to kill them. They shall be rescued tonight. There will be no moon. We will attack quickly. And before the Spaniards are out of their beds... Santiago will be ours. Doña Inez, the savages are battering at our gates. Lotaro is their leader. I saw him with my own eyes. We cannot hold out much longer, Doña Inez. As long as there is a man alive, we will defend Santiago. Oh, if Don Pedro were only here. But he's not here, and he won't be back for weeks. Where are you going? To the prison. Come along, Felipe. To the prison? I intend to keep my word. To Letaro. The seven Indian chiefs shall pay forfeit for this attack with their lives. Doña Inez, you do not intend I to... intend to do just that. Open the door, Felipe. Yes. Yes. But Doña Inez... Listen to me, Felipe. Only one thing can keep those savages from destroying Santiago. Only one thing. Fear. I, I do not understand. The seven prisoners must die. Their bodies must be thrown over the walls. When the Indians see that their chiefs have been killed, they will be terrified. And the Tara will know that I spoke the truth. Do you think it is wise? It to... is our only chance. Where are the Indian prisoners? They are chained over by that far wall. Here is a candle. I will carry it. Place the candle on this table. Mm, yes. Now, Don Felipe... Draw your sword. My, my sword? Oh, yes, my, my sword. Well, what are you waiting for, Felipe? I am to kill them in cold blood? Why do you think I brought you here? Oh, I can't do it, I can't do it. Fool! I tell you, it's our only chance. Our lives, the lives of our men depend upon it. I helped build this town, helped to build it with my own hands. It belongs to me and to Spain. I won't see it destroyed by savages. But, but I, I, I can't. Don't, Felipe. 
Give me the sword. What? Give me the sword. Hmm, your hand is trembling. Look at mine. The sword is steady in my hand. You? A woman? A woman? No. A Spaniard, Don Felipe. A Spaniard! My Pedro, that was the only thing that saved Santiago. When the enemy saw that their chiefs had been killed, the attack stopped almost at once. The Indians ran away in terror. You are a brave woman, Inez. Oh, but I'm sick of strife and bloodshed. Let us pray that there will be no more war. Let us remain side by side and build Santiago into a great city. Alas, my darling, that is impossible. Pedro, what do you mean? This letter. It came today from the king. The king? I must never see you again, Ines. The king has ordered it. Never see me again? The king has decreed that all married men in Chile must send for their wives. As you know, I have a wife in Spain. But Pedro, you love me. You've told me that you love me. I am a soldier. I must obey the king's command. It isn't fair. I was the only woman who dared come to Chile. I wanted to help you carve a new country out of this wilderness. What other woman would have done the things I've done? No one. These hands, look at them. They've become hard from toil, scarred with the marks of battle. I know that I've been cruel, heartless. But I was fighting for Spain and for you. I've earned my happiness. They can't take it away from me. They can't. Felipe is waiting outside for me, Ines. To stay longer would only make parting more difficult. Goodbye. 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 Oh, Pedro, do that, dear. May God go with you. We must stop here, Felipe. My horse can go no farther. I think we'll be safe in this forest. I hope those savages are not on our trail, Don Pedro. If you want my opinion, I think we should return to Santiago. Uh, We're out of danger now. Uh, Tie your horse to this tree. Uh, The attack that night came so suddenly, I hardly knew what had happened. We were lucky to escape with our lives. Why must we journey to Peru? The king's orders. So, you are never to see Doña Inés again? Never. A strange, beautiful woman... Cruel, yet loving. I love her too, Felipe. Life will be very dreary. Don Pedro, I see something moving. Over there, behind that clump of brush. They are trapped, surrounded. Warriors with spears, they're everywhere. Don Pedro! Felipe! Move, Don Pedro, or I shall have my warrior kill you, too. Lotaro. You. Yes, it is I, Lotaro. Your servant no longer. Now I am chief of my tribe. I have waited long for this moment. What are you going to do with me? We have been expecting you, my friend. Our camp is only a short distance away, and you came straight to us. What are you going to do? We shall give you supper. If only the Dona Inez were here, uh, it would be pleasant to dine with the conqueror of Elida and his lady. Lotaro, would you defy the great father, the king of Spain? For my people? Yes. All the white man cares about is gold. Mala, have you brought the cup? Here, Lotaro. What? What is in that cup? Gold, Don Pedro. Molten gold that has been waiting for you many hours. Simmering over a fire. Gold is the food of the Spaniard. Here it is. Hot, molten gold. Drink your fill. Drink your fill. Today, on the granite heights above the city of Santiago, stands a statue of Don Pedro de Valdivia. But Inez Sores, the warrior's lady, remains only a mysterious figure on the musty pages of time. 
But it is said that sometimes, when the yellow moon is high above the Andes, a woman with chestnut hair and glittering green eyes is seen at Don Pedro's side. She is clad in armor, and she gazes longingly at the city which she helped to build. Perhaps it is only a legend, or it may be an apparition formed by the night mists billowing through the valley. Or perhaps it is the ghost of Doña Inez, seeking solace by the side of her departed lover. From Santiago, we travel back to the seacoast. Boarding our ship again, we head for an island west of the mainland. The island of Masatierra is a green splotch of land shaped like a half moon set in blue ocean. Here, an event took place that was destined to make this spot one of the best known islands in the world. Let us go back to September 1704. A British merchantman is anchored in the curved bay. Standing on her deck is hot tempered young Alexander Selkirk. I won't sail on this ship another day, Captain Stradley. I should hang you for mutiny, Selkirk. Go ahead, hang me. We haven't had decent rations for three months. The rest of the crew feel like I do, but they're afraid to stick up for their rights. Aren't you afraid, Selkirk? I'm not afraid of anything. I'd rather die than sail under a captain like you. All right, you've asked for it, you'll get it. I'll put you off on this island with an axe, a matchlock, and a little gunpowder. And my books. Yes, you'll need something to occupy your mind from now on. That suits me. You know, we only stopped here to fill our water casks. Another ship may not drop anchor here for years. I'll take a chance on it. You're a headstrong fool. But there won't be anyone for you to quarrel with here. You'll have plenty of time to meditate. Plenty of time. Maybe the rest of your life. into months, months into years, and Alexander Selkirk remained marooned on this deserted island. Then, on the 31st of January, 1709, a British vessel sailed into the bay. A boat was lowered, and first mate Thomas Dover, accompanied by one of the seamen, went ashore. If you ask me, Mr. Dover, I don't like this business, tromping through underbrush that might be full of snakes and wild animals and all sorts uh, There are no snakes on this island. And you'll not find any animals except wild dogs and goats. What are we looking for? We saw a light burning on the shore last night. The skipper thought we'd better investigate. Maybe there's cannibals on this island. Ah, nonsense. Before I left London, my wife, she says to me... Here, Mr. Delva. What do you see? Blimey, footprints. Men's footprints. Aye. And they lead through those bushes. Come on. Right beyond you, sir. Look. Straight ahead. Isn't that a cave? If it ain't, I'm balmy. It's got a gate built up in front of it. And the gate is opening. Someone's coming out. A man. Dressed in goat skin. Fierce looking bloke, ain't he? Look at that beard. Uh, hello. 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 Maybe he ain't got no tongue. Can't you talk, mister? Who are you? I'm Thomas Dover. Mate of the English privateer, Duke... We saw a light burning here last night. Well, that was my fire. I light it every night, hoping that some ship will see it. Well, what are you doing here? Waiting to be rescued. Four years, I... I haven't spoken to a soul. I've lived here, in this cave. You won't have to live here any longer, old man. We're taking you aboard, back to England. England? Ain't you never heard of it? Yes. England. England. And, uh, Mr. Selkirk... You say every word of your story is true? Yes, Mr. Defoe, every word of it. You lived in a cave for four years, made your own clothes out of goat skins, and... That's uh... right. My only companions were my books and my dog. 
and a parrot that are caught in a trap. Mm, a very interesting story. I wonder if I might use it in a book that I am writing. A book? Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> I'm a writer. Daniel Defoe. Perhaps you've read my... <laughs> I keep forgetting. You've just recently returned. Well, if you can use my story, you're welcome to it. Oh, thank you. Of course, I'll have to change it a bit. And I won't use your name. I'll call you Robinson. Uh, now, let me think. Robinson Crusoe. That's it. The life and adventures of Robinson Crusoe. Such was the story of Alexander Selkirk, the real Robinson Crusoe. As we visit Massa Tierra, we see a marble tablet set against the rocks, a tribute to the man who made the island famous. But the years have brought a great change to Massa Tierra. It has become a prosperous fishing port, and only recently the Chilean government declared it a national park. High radio towers flash messages to many ships which now pass these shores. But to many a boy and girl throughout the world, Robinson Crusoe's island will always remain deserted. The last outpost of romance and adventure. <laughs> Returning to the mainland of Chile, we sail northward past angular pinnacles and cliffs which overlook the sea. The land has become hot, barren, brown. No grass or vegetation of any kind grows on this forbidding coast. We are in the nitrate country, source of Chile's greatest wealth. Entering the port of Iquique, we see automobiles twisting and turning up the desolate mountainside, windshields sparking like flashes of golden fire in the afternoon sunlight. And over the dreary reddish hill lies the nitrate mine, where steam shovels bite into the arid soil and dig out the precious calichich. Fifty-eight years ago, a dispute over this nitrate-bearing land caused war between Chile and the combined forces of Bolivia and Peru. The War of the Pacific was renowned as a naval war, and one of the first battles took place here in the Bay of Iquique. May 21st, 1879, the Chilean warship Esmeralda is sailing from Iquique. A short distance away, coming toward the Esmeralda like a sleek greyhound, is the crack Peruvian battleship Auscar. On the bridge of the Esmeralda, we find Chile's young naval officer, Captain Arturo Pratt. He peers at the enemy through his binoculars and speaks to his lieutenant. Lieutenant Uribe, the cannon are charged and ready? Yes, Captain. But every gun on this ship should have been in this scrap heap long ago. Looks like we are in for a bad day, Captain. Uh, you're nervous, Uribe. Who would not be nervous? Look at the gun turret on that Peruvian. One good broadside from those guns, and it will be the end of the Esmeralda. Come here, Uribe. You see that flag... With a single star in the field of blue flying at our masthead, that flag has never been hauled down. It will never be struck while I am captain of the Esmeralda. But if something should happen to me, you would be next in command. I promise you, sir, those colors shall remain at the masthead as long as this ship stays afloat. That's all I wanted to know. Now go forward, Uribe. Take charge of the gunners. I'll give my commands from the bridge. Aye, aye, sir. Stand by your post, men! Stand by! Aye, aye, sir! Aye, aye, sir! Fire at will! Aye, aye, sir! Hour upon hour, the rattling roar of cannon shatters the peaceful morning, turning the Esmeralda into a mass of crumpled rails, broken stanchions, and splintered wood. Then, with a quick maneuver, the Peruvian ship rams its steel-plated bow into the Esmeralda's bulging side. <laughs> A grinding, rending crash, both vessels locked together. Suddenly a man is seen poised on the Esmeralda's main deck. It is Captain Arturo Pratt. Sword and pistol drawn, he leaps aboard the enemy ship. Come on, boys! Here's our chance! Porter! Follow me! Hurry up! Hurry up! His men start to follow, but before they can jump to the enemy deck, both ships swing wide apart. A burst of fire cracks from the enemy turret. The captain's sword glitters high in the air. A limp body lurches forward. They've killed him! They've killed him! Back to your gun, kill me! Keep firing! Keep firing! Hours drag by. The wounded ship settles lower and lower into the water. At last, the clamor of battle fades. Nothing is left of the Esmeralda but a shattered prow and one lone cannon. We are the only ones left, Riquelme. Yes, Lieutenant. But we still have one gun. Is it charged? Wait, I'll see. Yes. Yes. It is charged and ready to fire. Then aim it well. 
And let the shot be our last salute. To Chile. Our last salute. I said we would fight as long as there was one gun left. And this is it, Lieutenant. This is it. Thus, drunk with glory, Midshipman McKelmy fires the final shot. And the battered, broken corvette sinks beneath the waves. But the flag of Chile, with its one bright white star clinging to the foremast, is the last to disappear. And so it happened that the men of Chile proved themselves glorious even in defeat. But the loss of the Esmeralda was avenged, for Chile conquered both Peru and Bolivia and took possession of the great nitrate fields of South America. The valuable nitrates of Iquique have been stored into the hold of our ship, and we are now ready to depart from Chile. To see all of these strange, mountainous country would take months, perhaps years. For beyond the mountain ranges lies a vast desert, once an ocean bed, but now filled with the remains of petrified sea animals and stone lizards, all sparkling weirdly in the blazing sun. And high in the snow-capped Andes, a railroad burrows its way through rocky clefts like a long, shining serpent. Although it is a modern country, with airports, golf courses, theaters, and factories, Chile is like a precious, uncut stone, which needs only the polishing hand of time to bring out its true richness and beauty. And so we leave you, Chile. Hard, brilliant, glamorous. A land inhabited by the wanderers of four centuries, who have made you their final port of call. invite you to join us again next week at this time as we journey to another of the world's fascinating ports of call. <laughs>